Ladies and gentlemen, Gene DiNapoli. Hey, Gene. Hi, Mike. How are you? Good. How are you? Happy Monday. Good. Happy Monday, as always, as always. Happy Monday and, and happy start of another week to all our friends out there in social media land. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you for tuning in to what's going to be one of our best episodes here at Reminiscing with Gene DiNapoli. I'm Gene DiNapoli, of course, with my host, my producer, Mike Dorita. How was your weekend, Mike? Very good, Gene. Very good. It, it went fast, just like, just like always. But, uh, you know, like I said, Friday goes fast, Monday back to work, and here we are. You know, I decided yeah. I'm going to throw my hat in the ring in the politics game, and my platform is going to be making it a three-day weekend. Okay. That's, I think I should get three or four votes if I do that. I, I, yeah, you got mine right now. Right? You got mine. So what did you do this weekend? Anything? Yeah, I had a show uh, s Friday night up in Yonkers. I played with a guy who I call Uncle Bobby. Uh, DJ Bobby James. We did like a duo show. He did four songs. I did four songs back and forth. And it was um, it was actually a tribute to his wife, uh, Aunt Cookie, who passed away, who always wanted me and Uncle Bobby to do a show together. Uh, so it worked out and it, we had so much fun. We're going to do it again in a couple of months. So right you know, it, it's going to be uh, it's going to be something fun. You know, he does his thing. I do my thing. And somehow we gel together. Right. Nice. Yeah. Very nice. Mike, you know, uh, we always have a lot to talk about. I want to get the sponsors out of the way because we have a show tonight, which is going to take up a, a lot of time. Uh, so right now, let's put our sponsors up very quickly. This is Pure Organic Dry Cleaners, 3166 East Tremont Avenue in the Bronx. Uh, mentioned on my podcast, uh, pay for three items, get the fourth one free. Uh, Dream Destinations Travel, our friends Howard and Karen mentioned our podcast, get a 50 or $100 gift card when you book a vacation, whether it's cruising or honeymoon planning or sandals. For those of you that are into CBD oils and all that stuff, uh, cannabis, sweetheel.com, use the code Gene, 20% off all your orders and a free gift. Last but not least for this week, Francisco, the creative CPA. You can see Fran's uh, info up there for your estate planning, accounting, and uh, tax services. And Perfect. all of our sponsors are under our page, the Reminiscing with Gene DiNapoli page under the tab offers. So yeah. check it out there. Say hello to a few people. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, it's just, it's, it's, I shave. Yes. Let's get it out of the way. Uh, so I have a part in a show uh, that we were supposed to film last week. We got stopped because one of the actors got COVID. So the scruffiness is because I play the main character's father in a TV show. So uh, this, this has got to stay. This has to stay for now. That nah, looks good. Looks good. I, I, I like it too. Yeah. But you know, uh, <laughs> Mike, we have had singers and we have had actors on the show. Uh, but our guest tonight is a triple threat. Uh, singer, actor, comedian. This guy does it all. He is another hidden gem. You always see him in little movies and big movies and he's got little parts. But this man has made a career for over 55 or 60 years playing all over the world. So, Mike, let's get the show on the road. Will you please welcome our guest for tonight, singer, actor, comedian, and all-around great guy, Mr. Tony Darrow. <laughs> there he is. Nice. That was really good. You like that intro? I'm going to record that and use that. <laughs> I, I read it exactly as you wrote it for me, Tony. Right here. That's terrific. See you, right, Mike. How you doing? Very good. Good, good. Thanks, Tony. Uh, I tell you, Tone, we have had so much fun with our shows, uh, and I, I there's no slur on anybody else. You seem to have gotten more uh, thumbs up on Facebook Thank when you. you announced you were going to be here. And I have to say this one thing from a friend of mine for a lot of years. You used to go to the Central Deli in Florida, New York. That's right. I lived there. My dear friend, Jim, Used to meet you there, and used to you, your kids. He was a coach 
and he sends his big love to you, Jim, from the Central Deli. In well, I still go there. I mean, that's that deli is unbelievable. I wish every business in the world could do what that place does. It's it's like on a triangle right in the uh, end of Florida, and you can't get in there. It's it's um, and the food is sensational. That's and, that's uh, amazing. That's amazing in Florida, New York. Yeah, Florida, New York. Uh, Tony, I you know I knew of you. I've seen you, uh, and then it turns out we have a mutual relation who you're very close to right. and when I started to dig in to your career i i can't believe uh, like i said you're a triple threat uh which is rare in this business to do two things well you do all three uh but your first love was singing am i correct yes in fact i just saw on, on your promo uh, you have a picture with Tommy James and the Chandels. Yes. Right? Okay, well, I recorded with Roulette Records. I, that's where I had um, uh, two albums out, and I had three records. One of them uh, made the charts. And uh, I started out just as a nightclub performer, singer, and uh, I was always a ball break. I was always teasing and carrying on and doing shtick. And then uh, when I started working the Catskill Mountains is when I started doing – my act uh, full-time, and uh, from there, it just snowballed. You know, uh, Buddy Hackett was – I started uh, – uh, I was his opening act for three years. Don Rickles for two years. Foster Brooks. You remember Foster Brooks? Yeah. He played, in fact, the beard, you look like him a, a little, little bit. Little bit. I, right. like the, I like the beard. It's beautiful. Right. Thank you. Thank you. But you, and, come, uh, you came from Brooklyn. Were you part of a musical family? No, well, my grandmother was an opera singer, but she, you know, just uh, not not professionally. But uh, I used to sing do up on the corner all the time with the guys, and you know that's how it just started. And then I was such a clown in school. I never was a hoodlum, but uh, I'd get thrown out of class every day for breaking the kids up, you know, or the teacher <laughs> they're doing. So uh, every time there was a, a show, go get Anthony. Anthony could do it, and I started singing and doing all that stuff, and. Uh, it just snowballed, and you know, beside the nightclubs, I've done fifty-two films. Yes, I've, I've actually been in fifty-two freaking films. I can't even imagine th that, that my career went that long. You know, yeah. and uh, I, my first film was a film called Street Trash. It was a cult following, uh, horrible, terrible movie. Uh, uh, they cut off a guy's dick in it. Oh. Uh, no, seriously. <laughs> and, and, yeah. and it became a college phenomenon. All the college kids wanted this film. Uh, you got to get it. You got to look at it. Uh, and uh, what happened from that is everybody, I would go promote another film on a film festival, and they'd yell out, what about Street Trash? Tell us about that. And this went on for years. Uh, this movie Street Trash, and that's how Scorsese saw me. Right, right. Uh, and that film, Street Trash, I played a wise guy. Right. And the next thing you know, I don't have to read for Goodfellas. I wound up getting uh, a principal role in Goodfellas. I played Sonny Buns. Yes. His real name was Sonny Bamboo from the Bamboo Lounge, which I performed in. You did. Yeah. 20 years before I got the film, 25 years, I performed at the Bamboo Lounge on Rockaway Parkway in Canarsie. And I opened for a comedian called Scoey Mitchell. He was a, a black uh, comedian, a very funny guy. And uh, from there, it went on, it just snowballed, and I worked all over, Vegas, Atlantic City. I had my own television show yeah. in Sydney, Australia. Yeah. Uh, uh, just just amazing, just so, amazing. So for those of you that are tuned in and didn't know that Tony uh, was a vocalist, we're going to play you a little clip of uh, one of Tony's singles, uh, and if you like it, go on YouTube, listen to the whole thing. And uh, this is um, Dan Juan. Uh, Dan Juan Dreaming. And it's about, a, it's about a Puerto Rican kid who the war is pushing the car down in the garment center and he keeps thinking of home. And it's like a Tony Orlando type of a. When the sun comes up, well, I get up and I go downtown. The work is hard and the days are long. Darling, the nights are even longer. But each time I weaken, just the 
Love it. Love it. Yeah. Very, very Tony Orlando ish. Very good. Yeah. And then so, I had another one uh, yeah. called uh, uh, Happy Days about the Palisades Park. Uh, wow. Uh, there's a place and it's green as any country mountain. The birds singing, how the sunshine. Wow. Same, same type of a thing, you know. And, so, uh, but those records weren't on roulette. They were on. Oh, no, they were on after I left roulette. But I have an album out on roulette, a big album uh, that got a lot of play. In fact, it was on TV too. You know, selling it, selling it like you call up and you ask to to buy yeah. the record when they was doing that years ago. Right, K tell. So, Right. Yes, that's uh, it. What was the name of that album? Uh, a very special love. In fact, uh, honey, uh, can you get here? I'm going to show it to you. This uh, is from Mike, Roulette. Don't we this, have it? Mike, put it up. Yes, we got it, Tony. Yeah, that's just Roulette Records. Yes, Mike, yeah. put that up on the screen for all our special love. Yeah, there it is. A very special love. And that's a <laughs> that's in Central Park, and I'm standing on a rock. And the, the, that's what they th look how skinny I was. Jesus Christ, I'll tell you. Well, you know, you, you're, you're probably still skinny now because you are an imposing six foot one and a half, right. which a lot of people I think don't I know. shrunk a little bit, though, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah and, you know, I still, I'm, I'm in good shape. I work out. I, uh, I still vocalize. I still take care of myself. So right. I when try. When you do shows, do you, when you do your comedy skit, like this Friday, you have a sold out show in Jersey. Do you do San Juan Dreaming? No, no, no. Uh, no. I do. Well, because in my nightclub act in Vegas and in Atlantic City, I wasn't that type of a singer. I was more of a Bobby Darren Sinatra type. I, 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 I was like a Sinatra, but I did stick, you know. In fact, I mentioned Sinatra, Mr. Sinatra. He came to see me at the Rainbow Room, you know. That's amazing. He was appearing at the Westchester Premier Theater. Sure. A, a, a friend of mine that uh, had a piece of the restaurant asked him to come and, and see me. And so this is, you got yeah, I could tell the story, right? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. What are you saying? Yeah. Right. This yeah. is very funny. So my friend calls me up and he says, uh, I'm bringing Sinatra in to see you to, on your opening night, on Monday night. And I said, really? So I call the whole world and I tell him, they're coming. He's coming to see me. Yeah, bullshit. No, he's coming to see me, right? So the, I, the place is jammed. He don't show up. <laughs> so in the morning, my friend calls me. He says, Tony, I'm real sorry. He I got called away the last minute. He couldn't make it. But we're coming tonight. So I tell everybody that, that I knew again, please come because Sinatra's going to be there, right? He doesn't show up again. So the third night, I'm down in my dressing room at the Rainbow Room. Uh, it's two floors down. Yes. You know? So uh, I'm in my dressing room, and I get a call from the maitre d' because they're all breaking my balls about this. You know, uh, you're full of shit. He's not coming. He's not. So they go, Tony, you better get up here. Uh, Louis here with your fr with uh, with Frank Sinatra. I go, go fuck yourself. <laughs> you're full of shit, right? Tony, get up here. He's here. So now, and I was a polished pro. I was working Vegas. I was working every night. Nothing bothered me. I never got shook. You know, I, my act was like well oiled, you know. Right. So I go up and I see him and I, I could feel the, the saliva in my mouth getting like chalk. You know, I was so excited to see this guy, you know. And I walk over to the table. I say hello to my friend. And he says, go say hello, Mr. Sinatra. I walk over. Thank you so much for coming, Mr. Sinatra. He says, I came for your friend, but uh, I hear you're terrific. And you could use my name however you want, as long as it's not negative. So I couldn't wait to call my publicist, you know, the Frank Sinatra. Right. And at right. that time, my opening song was, don't deny me, satisfy me one more time. And right. then my, my third song was, let me try again. Great song. Me, and I'm closing with my way. Right. And I got to do this in front of him, right? Hmm. And I was really shook a little bit. But I had a nice, I had an eight-piece uh, band there. And I had a conductor. And it was just, and anyway, I blew him away. And he loved it. And oh, so uh, he says, you know, Louis says, if you can, don't mention his name. So, so I didn't mention his name, but he was back there because I would have lost the audience. They all would have right. back there. Of, of course. course. I'm looking at him. But at the last song, I had to do it. I said, this is his song, ladies and gentlemen, in the back, Mr. Frank Sinatra. Sure enough, three quarters of the room got up and they low going to look at Frank, which was good because I was afraid to sing my way in front of him, you know? That was, that was a very exciting evening for me. You know, you talk I, about you talk about your friend Louie. 
Uh, I actually have had a cassette tape that Louis gave me uh, oh, yeah. from the Westchester Theater when Sinatra and Dean Martin played together in '77. And he, well, you know, he had that restaurant too, the separate tables. Which separate tables, great. absolutely. You're, you're a little young for that, though. You, I, I, I am. I am. But you know, I've been in the business forty years. My uncle used to own a restaurant in Yonkers called the Lazy Bowl. Uh, where I started singing, and and everybody was there, like Chance and all these guys. And we used to go to Sergio's. And, and we do you to... remember a place in in, in Yonkers called Trenchy's? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. we used to work there too. That yeah. was a great joint yeah. to work. Yeah. Yeah. But I must say this before we go any further. Happy belated birthday to you! October you still... first. October first, and ladies and gentlemen, I got to say it, Tony. If you never speak to me again, it is. I don't care. Yeah. I'm eighty two years old. Is eighty two years young. Yeah. Yeah, 82. 82 years young. You look phenomenal. I feel uh, great. Well, my wife keeps me young. That redhead you saw? Yeah. No, she keeps your me wife young. looks like Anne Margaret. I love it. It's just. It, and, it's and, and you know, you know, we have sex every night because she's hard of hearing. Okay. Yeah, I say to her, and I, you want to go to sleep or what? She says, what? So we have sex. <laughs> uh, crazy. This is great. So now, street, that street, uh, Street Trash comes out, Street trash. right? And, and then the next and thing I'm, you do, you're in Goodfellas. I mean, right. the, the very next right. thing, you're a principal in Goodfellas. Well, here's what happens. Street Trash comes out there looking for me because I'm not a movie actor. I'm a nightclub performer. I'm, at, I'm with the William Morris Agency, but I'm not in the in the theatrical department. I'm in the variety department. That's how smart these imbeciles are. That's why I left them after that. They're looking for me. Scorsese's looking for me. He can't find me because they don't even look to see if I'm in the, the motion picture right. uh, or, or the variety. A uh, big agency like that can't find one of their artists because they didn't look for variety. Right. So anyway, uh, I have to fly into, into New York from Atlantic City. I was appearing at the Claridge Hotel to go audition for this, but I never auditioned. I'll explain it. So I get on the Trump helicopter and I go to the uh, 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 Warner Brothers studio. It was right in Rockefeller Center at that time. And I go up and I've, I I walk in and I see this palatial, beautiful off, uh, reception room and this gorgeous girl behind the desk. And now I get a little excited. Say, wow, this is, looks pretty. And guess who walks past me? Jennifer Gray. Oh, my God. She's, coming out of, she's auditioning for Lorraine Brocker's part. Of course, she didn't get it, right. but she auditioned. And she walks out, and I go, that's that kid. That's a, And I even forgot her name. And I go, wow, this is exciting now. All of a sudden, Ellen Lewis walks out with oh, Marty, wow. Scors Marty Scorsese. And she goes, Tony Darrow. I said, yeah. Now, when I get nervous, I do shtick. I got nervous. Okay. So he sticks out his hand. I go, don't give me your fucking hand. I don't get this part. You and the broad going out the window. You know how to fly in on a helicopter for this shit, right? And he stared at me. And it was like my whole life passed in front of me. I thought, I, you idiot. You know, this ain't nightclubs. This is big time, you. You know, you blew it. And he right. goes like this. Jesus, this is what I'm looking for. He says, everybody gets all cotton mouth. They can't talk. You come in here. You're breaking my chops. He says, come on inside. So we go, and he don't sit behind his desk. He sits next to me. Okay. Right. And he goes, so what have you done? I go, what do you mean, what have I done? I've done one movie, Street Trash. He says, I know we saw that, but nothing else. I said, no. He says, you know what? You're a natural. I swear. You got the part of Sonny Bamboo. At that time, it was Sonny Bamboo. Then right. they changed it to Buns because he bitched about it. He didn't want Bamboo and, you know, the guy, the real guy. Right. So all of a sudden, uh, I'm going back to Atlantic City. And then about three days, four days later, I see Robert De Niro's cast for this. Joe Pesci's cast for this. Ray Liotta, uh, Paul Sorvino, and I don't see my name. What an idiot I am, right? I'm a nightclub performer. I think my name is going to be in in, in the ads, you know? <laughs> and uh, uh, I call up Lee Solomon, and I said, uh, Lee, I don't want to do the movie. So I said, my name ain't in the paper. They got to, he said, what are you, a fucking idiot? He said, <laughs> you know, it's your second movie. This is not nightclubs. You know, of course, I had my name on a marquee right. so going into Atlantic City, uh, sure. headlining and all that shit. Now, that's how, how smart I was. That I thought that I wasn't going to do the movie because my name wasn't up there, right. you know. Right. Of course, I did the film, yeah. and uh, it was the greatest thing that ever happened to me. After so, that, Ken, Mike, let's put up the picture of uh, Tony and Joe Pesci that 
you know, this scene probably stole the movie, uh, Tony, uh, when you walked up to him and asked for the seven G's. Uh, yeah. which I don't think any nightclub owner would walk up to <laughs> a guy like Joe Pesci's character and ask for the seven G's. So that was yeah, pretty uh, yeah. what happens is uh and I wrote that scene. I wrote that scene and I wrote the scene with Paulie with the bandage on my head. You what wrote happened it? was Yeah, well I knew I knew Tommy D. Simone, the real Tommy, you uh -huh. know. Yeah. And I knew Jimmy Burke, I knew Paulie Vario. I grew up in East New York over there. Yes. Right. So what happened is Tommy was really crazy. Mm -hmm. I mean, this guy was like a, a trigger nuts. I mean, he was really out of his mind. And it's so, said uh, that years yeah. ago, his brother, they said, was a rat. So because of that, I don't know, this is what they said. Right. But because he was so defensive that his brother was a rat, he wanted to be overly aggressive and okay. show that he wasn't. Okay. Right? So, uh, Keeping that in mind, uh, when when I, when uh, I said when Marty's yell, uh, when I'm saying to Joe Pesci about the money, I said, you know, this guy was a nut. He wouldn't have just said get out of here. He would have stabbed me. He would have shot me. He would have got a knife and cut my face. He would have done something. I said, or well, even hit me with a bottle. So Marty goes, good idea. <laughs> but honest to God. So they went. They got two two dozen breakaway bottles. Yeah, you know. And they fill them up a little bit. And so as, when you flip them back, they're almost going to break anyway. And that's what they use to break away bottles. And uh, the abrasion, I forget even what side it was on now. But uh, after after 15 takes of that, 15 takes we had. Yeah. There was one time Joey pull, pulled me down. My head is supposed to be up. You know, another time he hit me on the side instead of right where he's supposed to. And you had to change your clothes every time. I had three different outfits. So right. they got wet and blow dry my hair again, you know. So mm -hmm. I wrote that scene, you know, uh, 15. Wow. Right. And the other one with the Paulie about Paulie, what do you want me to do? Kill this guy? Right. I wrote that whole scene. Marty called me in the trailer and asked me if. Uh, you know all the street words. You know, guys talk different in different neighborhoods. Of like course. Manhattan, like when you got a, a, a phony watch, they don't. They call it a fugazi. Right. But right. in East New York, we didn't know what fugazi meant. You know, it's a right. phony watch. You know, right. so things like that, little phrases that we used on the corner, well, like putting a silk out on a pig or yeah, tuxedo right. on a monkey. You know, right. those phrases I grew up with. So. Marty said, put all those words in and use them. And that's what I did. Right. And so Vino got mad because the scene was he was supposed to question me. And now I got the lead in this, right. in that scene. And he got mad. And I, I said to Marty, when I come out and I started doing my line, uh, it was rehearsal. Uh, Paul Savino goes, oh, what fucking movie are you doing? <laughs> Just like that. And I go, hey, Marty, didn't you tell this guy? So finally whispered in his ear, but that's what he wanted. He wanted him angry. Right. And it worked. Yes, it really, okay. yeah. Mike, put up the picture of uh, Tony with the uh, Scorsese and De Niro and Pesci and everybody. Yeah, that's, uh, some, that's some... Look at that, how young I was. You know, Tony, you, don't, you, don't, you look the same. You look the same. <laughs> I was a little skinnier, huh? You, you look great, right. kid. You really do. Mike is ugly. Mike well, is not... Mike is not that handsome, you know. He's from Long Island. What are you going to do? Oh, I'm kidding. You of know, course. I was, uh, I, I had a very, very, very small, uncredited part in The Irishman. I was in the restaurant scene. Uh, I was confused. Yeah, uh, you see the side of my face. It was me and five other guys and the rest of the cast. And when I was breathing the same air as Scorsese, De Niro, Pe Pesci, Carvey Keitel, Ray Romano, uh, Bobby Cannavale. When I was in the same room with them, the energy was so big, it, I almost exploded, and I wasn't even—I had no speaking part. And I was—that's well, that's just what I was going to say to you. You see that scene when I'm standing with them? That's the scene when they want to take my nightclub away. Right. And I'm I, the, the line is uh, Pesci's supposed to say, "I'm standing there with the pen like this, sitting there." And Patchy spokesman says, Oh, what are you waiting for? How long are you going to sit there? Sign the fucking paper. And then De Niro says, When I smack him in the head and all that shit. So I'm thinking, I'm saying, They're raping me. They're really taking my nightclub away. Right. And I felt it. So when, when Marty says action, I went like this. 
What a fucking shame. Mm-hmm. Marty said, cut, that's it. That wasn't in there. Wow. No. Marty said, that's it. You don't need no more. So De Niro goes, oh, you did one movie and you're taking my fucking scene away already? Well, he was taking my balls. It was funny. And and uh, actually, that re- that really worked. That that Just that one line, what a fucking shame. You know, it really worked. And they didn't need any more dialogue. In well, you, you, you look like your whole world crumbled around you when you said that. Well, because, yeah. you know. Yeah, and then they burn my joint down, you know. Right, right. Yeah. Now, now through all the acting, Tony, were you still doing any singing? Or yeah, you- sure. yeah. Well, in fact, that's when I, you have no idea. I was starring at the Claridge Hotel in Pal Joey at that time. Okay. And I had to take a break to go do an audition for Goodfellas and then study those lines and do Goodfellas. I mean, and do Pal Joey. Right. So, so it was like... I lost 12 pounds from, from uh, aggravation, from nerves. I couldn't remember what scene I was doing here that till, till Pal Joey was over. Then I went and did Goodfellas, you know? I, I, I think I saw you at the Claridge because I, I used to be close with, uh, you know, Abu Nama, Sal Richard. Right. Uh, yeah. So I, And my father was a big gambler at Bally's. Uh, so I used to be in Atlantic City every weekend, and I – I think I saw you there uh, in the main room, in the showroom. Well, we uh, had another room, too, that I performed in all the time called the Celebrity Cabaret, which where yeah. Sal, Sal yeah. performed, Buddy Greco, Sal, yeah. myself, right. and uh, one other guy. Uh, I know Larry Chance. Daniels. Larry, Larry Chance performed there, too. Right. Larry so I love Larry. How's he doing? Fabulous. He's going to be on our show on the 7th. He is so uh, – another one, <laughs> Larry's one of the most talented singers I ever met. Absolutely. He does jazz. He does everything. You know, whenever I opened a restaurant or I promoted a show, Larry would always be my first person that I book. And he was like a good luck charm. I never lost money. Sometimes I made money. Sometimes I broke even. So Larry was supposed to be our first guest three months ago, but he caught allergies. So now he's going to be on at the 7th. Um, Is he still heavy? I know he gained a lot of weight, and I worried about him. I told him he's got to go on a diet, man. Yeah, he he loves his cream cheese omelets. I so, know. Good guy. And he, he, we lived together up in Liberty, New York, for a while. Yes. And we're not together in the yeah. same town, you know. Right. Well, in Florida, Jimmy Sir lives in Florida. I know. Jimmy's a good friend of mine, too. Yep. Yeah, great guy. Uh, we got a couple of comments. Yes, Ed, you must have got here late. Tony can sing. We played a little clip of his record. So maybe you could go to YouTube and look up San Juan Dreaming. Uh, we also got a uh, happy birthday to you from Jeannie Claire. We got a lot of great comments. Uh, my father in South Carolina says Chubby Smalls. Remember Chubby Smalls? Chubby Smalls, sure. Trenchies? Yes. Yeah. So that's, you know, a lot of great comments. When people interact, Tony, it really makes us know that they're so into you. Uh, now you were also going to analyze this with De Niro and uh, Billy Crystal. Right. Me, me, and uh, Chaz Palminteri were on the op- in the opposite crew, and right. I was I was uh, Chaz's right hand guy, and I was a big thrill doing that. Right. I got the big scene at the end when I went yes. to the table and Jelly walks in with Billy Crystal. Oh, hey, he's the Fajan, he's the weekend, all that crap. Right. Yeah. It was great. It was really so, good. Uh, when you work a movie with all seasoned actors. And then you're in a movie with a comedian as Billy Crystal. Do you see a, a, a real reverse role? Because I was in, I was in Analyze That as an right. extra. And I saw Billy Crystal in a way I've never seen him before. Well, he's a great actor and he's a great comic. He really knows what he's doing. And he comes, you see, uh, just let me just back up a little bit. Yeah. Scorsese. No, I did six Woody Allen movies in a row. I'm the only actor to ever do six in a row. Unbelievable. And the last one, I had one of the leads, Small Time Crooks. Yep. But I, what I was trying to get to is Scorsese and and and, uh, and um, Woody Allen work a special way. They hire an actor to do the, uh, the, the contents of the scene, but to do it in their own way. In other words, like, I always use this phrase, like... Uh, if I see you and I go, hey, Gene, you know, it's an honor to be in your presence. I'm overwhelmed by your company. I don't talk like that. That's the way a writer would write it. Yes. Hey, Gene, you know, I'm so glad to be on your freaking show. You know how long I've been looking to meet you? I said the same thing, but I did it in my own words. Absolutely. 
So Scorsese has a bit of a script. Woody Allen doesn't have a script at all. You go there and you wing it. You're coming down the stairs. You're going to go grab Chaz. When, when me and uh, Tony Sirico uh, go get Chaz Parmentieri in, in Bullets Over Broadway, we, we, we ad-libbed that whole thing. We ad-libbed most of the movie. Right. And that's the way they work. So when you see it, you go, geez, these guys ain't acting. They're real. They're, they're so real. Where do they get these kind of guys? Because he, they let you go. Right. You know? right. Now, the opposite is is uh, David Chase. If he says if and you say and, you're going back and fixing that. He wants exactly what he wrote. And you better do it that way. No Speaking change. David Chase, right. That's You on The Sopranos. Uh, the entire eight, run. Eight, huh? You were on the entire run. I did eight of the ten seasons, but not as a regular, as a recurring character. Right. I, I played uh, Larry Boy Barisi. I was Tony Soprano's uh, uh, cousin. And I, I was away in jail a lot. But when I would come out, that's when I was in. I right. did about, I don't know, I, I think I did maybe 18 or 20 episodes. Nice. Did you feel when you were on the set of The Sopranos that it was going to take on a life that it did? No. So that's a good story. I'm glad you brought that up. Let me get to that because that's important. I was in the first episode of the first season when uh, when Jackie April dies and we go to the cemetery to see him, you know, pay our respects. And Mama Olivia is there and all the guys. Right. And uh, uh, then I had another two scenes in that first episode. Now... I told you I did six Woody Allen movies. I did five, and now Woody wants me to star in the film with him, uh, John Lovitz, Michael Rappaport, Hugh Grant. Uh, what's her name? Tracy Ullman. Tracy, oh, my wife is sitting. Tracy Ullman and, and uh, uh, Elaine May. So he wants me back. He wants me back on Sopranos, David Chase. So all of a sudden, I get a call from my agent. He goes, uh, now I'm with Abrams Artist at that time. Me and Vinnie Pastore got the same agent, yeah. Abrams Artist. Um, so my agent calls me up. His name is Robert Adam. And he says, Tony, we have a dilemma. I said, what is that? He says, what do you want you to uh, give you one of the leads in the next film? But David Chase wants you at the same time. So I go, well, what do I do? He said, well, you know, it's only one season. You don't know how big Sopranos is. Imagine that. You don't know how important Sopranos is going to be. Right. But your, your loyalty is to Woody. You've done five Woody Allen movies. He took good care of you. You don't have to go and do this film. Not only that, you got one of the leads. So I said, all right. So I go and do it. And he calls, uh, you know, I, I signed the contract. And he calls up Sopranos and he says, he can't do it now, but he'll be ready in a month. And David Chase said, fuck him. I don't want him then. I forget. <laughs> yeah. So I didn't even know he said that. My agent never told me. So I go and do uh, Small Time Crooks, which I don't know if you saw it. It's a very, very funny film. We try to rob a bank and we screw everything up. And uh, David Chase kept me out of, out of that because I did that for two seasons, two years, because I didn't take that part. Then when he put me back, he put me back in the courthouse with Uncle Junior. And for the whole episode, I didn't say a word. I just went like this. <laughs> Gene, is, is this is this the um, – is that from – That's small time, small time Crooks. time Crooks, right. Small time Crooks. Okay. Yeah, there's me. That's me. Yep. With the hat on. So what happened here is we're so stupid, we drilled under the ground to get into the bank. And instead of making a right, we made a left, and we wound up in a woman's hosiery shop, right? <laughs> and with, so instead of stealing money, we're, we're grabbing jewelry and cl clothes and all that. There, that was very funny. Yeah. Oh my god. So, so uh, tell us about when you sang at Carnegie Hall. I mean, that's okay. that's a crowding achievement for a vocalist. Yes, and you want to know something? Well, you know, you're a pro. You've been doing it a long time too. When you're working every night. And you're vocalizing, and you're in good shape. This is what you do. Right. The most frightened I ever was when I became a real pro, and I was working all the time, was when Sinatra came to see me at the Rainbow Room. Not frightened, but nervous. Gotcha. And I was in my. I'll tell you this. Remind me about Carnegie Hall. But I'm in my dressing room when I go down to get ready to go on while he's there, 
and uh, Morty Storm. Remember Morty Storm? Absolutely. But your uncle loved him. Yep. Okay. Everybody loved him. Absolutely. Uh, and he was a court jester. He was my opening act because everywhere I went, I had to get saddled with this bastard. I had to put him on with me, you know. So, you know, he was cute, you know. And he did, the, he was on, he did his job. And I'm in the dressing room and I'm like this look, you fucking moron. Now you're scared. All of a sudden you're scared, right? You wanted this all your life. You did more things in the streets than guys got hair on their head. Now all of a sudden you're afraid. Because I'm not just there. Why don't you go home, you sissy? I'm talking to myself like this, trying to talk myself out of being scared because I'm not. And right. I did it. I went out and I killed him. Right. You wanted this, you better go and do it, you know? And that. So, anyway, Carnegie Hall was a piece of cake. You got the best sound, the best lights. You, I had, I had a 26 piece orchestra with violins and everything, you know? And so. It was. It wasn't. I wasn't frightened. I was excited to go out there and do it. I really was. And I opened for Shecky Green. Right. Shecky right. Green was the was the headliner, and uh, it was really a, a thrill of my life. But not as big as meeting Sinatra. It really gotcha. was. Gotcha. I used to play racquetball with Shecky Green at the Playboy in Atlantic City. Wow, you did a lot, man. Yeah, like I said. Uh, so tell us. A lot of people don't know that you had your own variety show. In Australia for a few years. In, in Sydney, yeah. In Sydney, Australia. You were like the, uh, the Johnny Carson of uh, right. Australia. Right, yeah. And what happened was that this is funny. All right. You're bringing up good stuff. I'm happy uh, to hear so that. Now, you know, when you, when you go, when you're a host, like I'm a host on your show right now. So you got to carry me. You got to bring stuff out of me. Uh, of course, I could just sit here and go, yeah, no. <laughs> you got to make me animated so that you look good too. Now, when you're the host, oh man! Now I got the I got this guy. It's like a treat. I got to get it out of him. He wrote a book. What the fuck do I know about books? <laughs> I read one page, right? And I talk about that page. He want to talk about the end. I go, no, no, no. We, you know, you got to learn how to pull it out of people. You're right. You're right. Now. I have a 16-piece band there, live. It's live. And in Australia, there's no such thing as you start at, uh, at 9 o'clock and you finish at 10.30. You could start at 4 minutes to 9 or 10 after 9, and whenever you finish, you finish. There's no FAA ruling there. Okay. You know? So uh, I'm in my uh, dressing room, and I'm going on, and, like, again, the saliva in my mouth was like chalk. You could take it and put it on the table. That's how nervous I was. So I go to the director just before showtime. I said, listen, you know, I sing. That's what I do. I said, so I want you to move the, the baby grand piano closer to the curtain when I come out because I'm liable to collapse. You know, that's how scared I was. And I got my own piano player with me, Tony Monty from New York. He came with me, my conductor. You know, he worked with Johnny Hartman and Mel Torme. He was okay. a great piano player. He was like my brother. And we flew to Australia together, and he stayed with me through the whole thing. So they put a stool near the piano and a, a glass of water, and I come out. This is very funny. I'm glad you brought this up. I come out, and I go, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. And as I'm talking, my lip is going like this. It's sticking to my teeth because my teeth were so dry. Oh, my God. Right? And I go, so anyway, and, and they go, go down again. And I kind of like, so now uh, – I said, and you, uh, I said, good evening, right? And I got a live audience, and I said, I want you all to imagine that, and it gets sticky, and I can just pull it down a little. And I go like that, right? And uh, I said, and you're with your very, very favorite chick, girlfriend, lover, wife, and I go, eh, you know, like that. Eh. Right? I said, and you look at her, and you go like this, and I get the arpeggio, and I go, the look of love is in your eyes, the look of, right? And instead of saying the look of love, I went like this, honest to God. He gives me the arpeggio, and I go, the look of love, because my look, it sounded like Chinese. And my piano, I swear to God. And I went like this. I thought I was going to die. And my piano player was like my brother, like you. Like, let's say, you know, you, you, might, you know everything. You know me inside out. He goes like this. The Rook of Rove, you ain't in China, you're in Australia, you idiot. Right? And when he said that, we fell on the floor. The band was laughing, everybody was laughing, and the people in the audience were laughing. Now we try to start it again. I go, come on, let's, now my eyes are tearing, my makeup is running. Right? So he gives me another arpeggio, and I go, 
But, and I start laughing again. And I start laughing. This went on for like four or five minutes. You know how long that is of laughing? I, I wind up getting the show. Because I was auditioning for the show. Oh, uh, so that was your audition? Yeah, there was there was Tommy Leonetti audition, a guy named Lovelace Watkins, Buddy Greco. There was a lot of people auditioning to get this show because there was a guy named Don Lane who had the show, but in 1969 he had some marijuana in his bag coming from the United States, and they caught him. You know, a little bit bit of marijuana. They made a big 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 deal out of it in those yeah. days, and he lost the show. I, so I, I, I wind up getting the show. What was the name of the show? The Rook or Rove? What was the name of the show? I, look, you know, I can hardly wait to hold it. The arms around you. You know that song. But well, instead, yeah. instead of saying the look of love, yeah. I went, the Rook of Rove. Like, it sounded like the Rook of right. Rove. Instead what of was the, the name of the show? Was it the Tony Darrow show? No, it was called Sydney Tonight. Sydney Tonight. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, then I used to fly to Melbourne all the time. There was a guy named uh, Don, John Laws who was real big. He was like Johnny Carson. Okay. Uh, and do his show, fly out in this small little plane and do that. It was wonderful. It was the mo most wonderful. I cried when I left, when I left Australia. Huh? Yeah. You yeah. know, uh, I wasn't going to bring this up, but because you mentioned her, we have to get your stunningly beautiful wife to say hello on camera to all of our yeah, you, Mary, you, you have to. Hold on, she's she's very very sexy and horny. Put your clothes on. And come over, come over here. Oh gee, I have to get dressed. Look, look at this. Look at this face. This is this is what happens when you're in entertainment, ladies and gentlemen. Let me tell you something. She she does everything. She works with me on my on my lines. And if I forget a word, she's like she's like David Chase. If I say if instead of and, she goes no 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 no. You did it wrong. Do it again. That she may, and also, I do a lot of, you know, what cameo is that? Sure. that thing, yeah, I do a lot of. I've done a couple of hundred cameos, and she, no, 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 you missed this here, you missed that, you missed. She fixes everything for me. She's, She's a great critic, great yeah. critic. So you said you were in fifty-two movies as yeah, a, as a principal. No, uh, no, well, I could, yeah, principal. Yeah, I never did extra work. Always a principal, and. uh uh I just did a film that I star in. Vinny Pistori and I, uh, I, I got the lead, and he's got this co-lead right. with me, and it's called Made in Chinatown. It's very good. Yes. It's real, And uh, what's his name? Uh, Boomba Johnny's in it. Yeah. Uh, a lot of a lot of our friends. A lot but, of our uh, friends are in it. Yeah. But, I wish I had, I wish I knew where to find you. I would have used you, honest to God. You know I what? Know, I, I, know I appreciate that. I wasn't doing much acting until two years ago. I primarily staying four or five nights a week. I'll stay in uh, touch because the next oh, one I do. Yeah, absolutely. We'll do but do you know, you might be, and I'm not getting racist or racial here, but you might be the most seen white actor the way Samuel Jackson has been in more movies than any African-American. Well, I think I've done more mob movies than most guys. And, and yeah. you know, I don't know something, Michael Imperioli, who I love that kid. He paid me a compliment that I, I will never forget. In fact, when he said it, I almost cried. He said that I, I created the, the new mob guy, the way the way I did the Goodfellas. He said uh, I was an original. I was the first one to to really show how a, a mob guy, uh, you know, delivered what was. Well, Tony, you were brought up. In the street, well, I was brought up in the street all my life. Yeah, so this is it's not, not acting that. for you. This is this is you. This it's, is me. It's, it's, it's real. It's real. Yeah, yeah it's so, real. Yeah, that's a good point. So you've played a multitude of street guys. Right. What would be the one role or one part you would like to get offered that's totally opposite of what you are? You want to know the truth? I'd love to play a gay guy. I'm, don't laugh. I really would. I'm not laughing. No, because I do. I do it very well. And you I, do, you know. And I, yeah, and I do it on my my nightclub back. I tell gay jokes, you know. But that's all all shtick. It's all fun. Right. But I would. I uh, I've done. I played priests. I've played lawyers. I've played the uh, husbands. You know, and poor poor souls and all. That. But I think that would be great just to do that kind of a 
a thing. And I'd love to work with Joe Pesci, uh, with uh, uh, Al Pacino once. I really would. I think he's fan. So is De Niro, of course, and so is yeah. Pesci. But I would love to do something with with uh, Al Pacino. You know, when, when we were doing The Irishman, I was in the courtroom scene when Pacino walked in and did his scene. And it was like Christ walked in the room. Yeah, he's it was like Christ walked in the room. And so was, you know, oh, here's another thing. I don't know if it's like that all the time, but when we did uh, analyze this, that's another great director. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, Hal Ramis. Hal Ramis. He's very close to those two, uh, yeah. working like the way they do. Right. Harold is wonderful, wonderful man. But uh, the scene when I stand up and I go, all right, fellas, let's get started. We've got a lot to talk about it. You know, when there were all the mom guys around and Jelly walks in with the uh, right. crystal. Yeah. Okay. So uh, uh, how was I going to say? Uh, about Harold Ramis. Oh. We're talking about Pacino. Oh, so De Niro, oh, this is what I was going to say. So De Niro, you don't see him until he's ready to, to shoot, okay? He walks in, and he goes, uh, hold, hold, hold it up there. And he walks in, remember? And he goes and gets uh, uh, Billy Crystal to get up, and he stands there, right? Right, right? He doesn't know the lines. No. He don't even read them. Because he could do 30 takes if he wants, 40 takes, right? This is, I mean, I don't know if he does that all the time, but in that scene that I saw, he didn't know what he was saying. In other words, he, he knew what he want or what the scene was, but he didn't know the lines at all. And he just wings it. And at the end, it's a gem. It's like, oh, my God, look at what he just did. You know? Like, we're killing ourselves trying to yeah, study, yeah. study. And he just goes and does yeah, it. The part in the Irishman, when he walked into the restaurant, they must have done 15 takes. And each take, he said something different. Right, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah. Exactly. So he does that all the time. Then. He does that all the time. Uh, I, I just want to touch on this because uh, it's you know you you've done so many big moments, uh, Carnegie Hall, uh, having Sinatra. You know, it's one thing to meet Sinatra in an elevator, but to have him sit in your audience. Uh, do you? Not only that, I've gone out to dinner with. Oh, you want another cute story? Okay. Um, yeah. I'm appearing at the Stardust Hotel. Remember Pat Henry? Sure, Pat Henry yeah. was Sinatra's opening yeah, act for yeah, years. Yeah. Well, Pat Henry and I had the same manager. So uh, I'm appearing at the Stardust, and Sinatra is at Caesar's Palace. And Pat called me up after one of the shows, and he said, come on over. Frank wants to say hello to you. And I'm going, Frank wants to say hello to me. <laughs> you know, like I almost shit myself again. I said, <laughs> Okay. All right, yeah, you know. So I finished my show. I used to do three shows a night at the Stardust in in the in the Starlight Room, right? So I finished my my third show, and he says Frank is in the Baccarat Pit when you come over. And if I'm not standing there, wait until the hand is over, and then go say hello to him. So at that time it was 1973, I think, or four. All the white guys were getting afros. There was like a thing to try it, right? So I wanted to try it. Somebody talked me into it. I look like Harpo Marx. I look like a freaking moron. In fact, honey, do we have a picture of me? I have a picture. I don't know. See, oh if we can get the picture. See if we can find that picture. You're going to die. Oh so anyway, so I got this big fuzzy thing on my head. My, my birds were coming out of it, right? So I thought I looked good. But, you know, the boss is, I'm going to go see the boss now. So I walk over, sure enough, and Pat looks at me. He says, what the fuck did you do to your head? He said, hey, I wanted to try it. He said, oh, all right. He says, well, the hand is over. Go say hello to Frank. So I walk over, and I, I go, hi, Frank. How are you? I give him a kiss, and he goes like this. Go get a haircut. What are you, nuts? <laughs> like, you know, I was looking for a barber at 2 in the morning to go get a haircut, and the next morning I did get a haircut. The curls were so tight that I got it cut down, and they looked like, you know, they were like this small now, but it was all little curls. It was, it was terrible. Right? But you say get a haircut, you got a haircut, you know. I'll never forget that. Yeah. And then another time, we're at Jilly's. It's like four in the morning. And Pat says, you got your car? I said, yeah. He said, why? He said, Frank wants to go and eat, but he's going in the limo. We're going to go to 68 Mott. Now, this is true, honest to God, every word. So I get in the car with Pat uh, and with the 
Morty Storm and Jilly Sun and whoever, and they went in the limo, a couple other people in my car. And we go to 68 Mott, and the sun is starting to come up. And he loved this restaurant. It was a long, narrow Chinese restaurant. He loved the food there. And he's doing all the shtick, no ticky, no shirty. And he's doing all kinds of stuff with the Chinese guys. All of a sudden, like 80, 90 Chinamen outside the window staring, looking at Frank Sinatra. I don't know where they came from, but they knew who Frank Sinatra was down there at 5 in the morning. Can you imagine how, how, how popular he was? He was a god. Absolutely. And he's the sweetest, kindest man you ever met that I know of, you know, that to me anyway, you know. Yeah, a, lot, a lot of misgivings about him. A lot of people that shouldn't talk because yeah. they don't know they talk. Right. Uh, no, exactly. for, those in, for those people that actually knew him on a personal level, uh, they have a different opinion of him. Yeah, and he was a very giving guy. Very giving. Charity, you know, all that stuff. Well, we know that, yeah. yeah. Uh, tell me... Now, when you started performing, I, I don't personally, were your parents are alive at this point? Yes. Yeah, sure. So, uh, were, were they alive when you appeared on The Tonight Show? Yes. yes. And do and you Joey, Bishop, Joey Bishop brought me on The yeah, Tonight Show. Do you show. feel that that was when you could really say to your parents, I made it? Because that was the... Pinnacle. You know, you want to know something, and you would know more than most guys that would know because you're street like me. Uh, I never was affected. Like uh, we don't know each other that well, but I'm not affected. What who I oh, but, oh you ready? Wait, we got to do this. You ready? Yeah. Can you see this? Let me see. Uh, put it up. Pick it up. No, up, 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 up. Keep up. Oh my God! No, you didn't. Oh That's my it. God! You could see that. Yeah, <laughs> that was me in 1973. That's a 70s porno star publicity photo. I don't look like I got something in my ass. Look, <laughs> look, look, look at this. <laughs> look at this. This is disgusting. But that's what I did. He told me go get a haircut. I wouldn't get a haircut. It's fabulous. You that's see what fabulous. my wife does? How she gets finds everything. Love but anyway, it. what were we just talking about? About <laughs> being street and not. Um, Right. So I'm not affected. Like, you know, people come up to me in a restaurant and they go, oh, can I uh, can I take a picture? Can I have the autograph? You know, and I'm looking, I'm going, they really want my picture. I can't believe, you know, like, you know, I don't think about it. I'm not rude. I'm Because someday they're not going to want my picture. You know what I'm saying? I mean, I'm 82. I hope, you know, they still want it when I'm 90. But I'm not affected by about who people think I am or I think I I don't think I'm anybody. I'm I'm Marianne's husband and I'm Anthony's father. And that's about it. When I'm on stage or I'm doing a film, I know my lines. And when I'm on stage, I you're not gonna top me. I'm gonna be the, the best one out there because I know what I'm doing. But right. that's knowing your trade. That's right. not being an egomaniac. I'm not an ego you know, like you meet a guy, I don't want to mention any names, but there's a lot of them out there. Oh, uh, like, uh, hey, Louie, how you doing? Oh, yeah, I just did this and I just did that. I, I didn't ask you what your credits were. I asked you how you doing, you schmuck. What do you, you know, go tell a freaking layman what you what you did. I don't want to hear what the fuck you did. You know, I mean, this the, the stench to some people's egos are unbelievable, you know, and I can't stand. I, I don't really hang out with a lot of showbiz guys that are like that. Right. Because I, I, I have a bit of a temper. And uh, I don't like uh, phonies. I, I really don't, you know. Right. Uh, <laughs> that's that's incredible because you, you you came up in a tough neighborhood from New York, and you are so far the opposite of what people probably perceive you to be. It's true. It's true. You know, but so I'm not I'm not embarrassed to say it. When I was a kid, you know, my old man was in a can. He was away. And uh, it was tough for me. We got dispossessed out of a few houses, right. my, my, my mother and my kid brother. And, you know, I had to steal milk. In those days, you remember when they had uh, milk boxes on the stoops? You put sure. the, the Silver ones. I had to grab milk and take it from out of boxes so my kid brother could eat and I could eat. You know, it wasn't it wasn't uh, easy. It was tough. Oh, here, here's another one. Watch this. You ready? Yeah. Hey, look at this. Okay. Navy. That's my Navy. That's why I was in the Navy. Fabulous. That's why I was 18 years old. You see it? 
Fabulous. Yeah. That's great. I wish I had these pictures pre uh, pre show so we could. I, I, didn't even, I, didn't even, I didn't even think about it, but you yeah. know, first of all, I love what I'm doing. I love performing. I love movies. I think that if you ask me what I would rather do, sing or act or do comedy, I'd rather be on stage because uh, if you're animated and you're not uh, intimidated, acting is pretty simple because if you do it uh, the wrong line you could do it again but on stage if you fuck up that's you it and take it back you're right. so you better have a line if you hit a clinker or right. whatever oh i just ate oysters or whatever the line might be you know you got to have a line to to overcome that and the instant reward on stage when you do like uh like from my way right. and the people stand up at the end it's like oh my god you know, I worked in front of 20,000 people at the Riverfront Coliseum in, in uh, Cincinnati yeah. yep. when when uh, the Beverly Hills uh, nightclub burnt down and all those people died in, in Louisville, Kentucky. Yes. And we had to perform to raise money for the kids that survived. And uh, uh, was the Fifth Dimension, Don Rickles, Joey Heatherton, myself, uh, a lot of people. It's called the Riverfront Coliseum was the Beverly Hills nightclub. I'll never forget it. Right. Uh, just one, 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 20,000 people stood up. You thought the building was collapsing. Right. And I only did three songs. And I got a standing ovation on my way. And I'll never forget it. Those are the thrills that you never forget. Now, when I watch myself on film, I go, oh, Jesus, you're getting old. You could have delivered the line better. What are you doing? You're stupid. You're turning this way. You should have been that way. You could have said this. You should, you know. I'm very critical of myself, but at the end, they come out pretty good, I guess. Yeah. Because people still watch me. You're a live performer at heart. Yeah, I'm a live performer at heart. Yeah. Um, and so were you. I am, and, and amongst this difficult situation, which is why I created this podcast, and I've been so blessed that it's doing well. Yeah, it's doing great. Only two people have told me no. And in a year, they're both going to be asking to be on this show. Don't put them on. Screw them. Maybe. But you know what, Tony? I, I, I hope that – I know you've done podcasts before. I hope that what we did tonight made you smile a little more because you made other people smile. So we want people to know you're just not a one-trick pony. Well, let me say something about you, okay? I don't know you that well. You know, we only met maybe once, I think. Yeah. Right? But you are terrific as a host. You do a hell of a job. And you're not lost for words. And you get to the to the heart of what you want to say. And you bring it out of me, too. So you're excellent at what you do. And I want to tell you another thing. Keep the beard. It looks great. I'm going to try. I'm going to try. You know, I do Elvis Presley mostly, but I'm not doing any shows. So can't do Elvis with the beard. But... Right. Uh, we you, should do something together one day. We are going to do something together for the Tony Lip Foundation. We're going to get this done. Uh, one more point. Uh, no matter what goes on in your career or your life, there's one thing that they can never take away from you, and that was on October 10th, 1997. You were bestowed a great honor. Uh, they, could, they called it Tony Darrow Day. And you got the Distinguished Citizens Award from the Boy Scouts of America. And I think that's due to your giving of You're people. Sure that, huh? yeah. So uh, if everybody out there in social media land will give this gentleman a big round of applause, make sure you go to his website, TonyDowell.com. Tony, I, I can't thank you enough. Uh, Michael? I love the haircut with the cutout on the top. That's nice. <laughs> Tony, but just before, when you said Mike was ugly, you're talking about a different Mike, though, right? No, you, you, Michael. No, I'm, no, I'm only kidding. Of course, I'm a ball breaker. You know I mean? <laughs> Tony, two days. How dare you? How dare you? Maybe we could, uh, maybe we could bring you back in about six months to tell us what's going on with you. Whatever. I enjoyed this very much. Like, yeah. And <laughs> I got it. Did you ever think about writing a book? Yeah, except that I'm a little worried about writing a book because, uh, you know... I, a couple I, of people are still alive. A couple of people are still alive, and even if they're not alive, they're sons or their relatives, and I'm a little afraid of that, but I got stories. Well, you can write a book on your career 
And I got a perfect title for you. What? The Rook of Rove. The Rook of Rove, right. And <laughs> that's a true story. Mr. Tony Darrow. God bless you, Tony. Thank you, Eugene. God bless Enjoy. you. And you, bye, Michael. Bye, Marianne. Michael. Bye. Right. You know what's good? That COVID is out now because if you wear a mask, you can get a girl. <laughs> All right, Mike. Thank you. I, I, I appreciate the tips. <laughs> right up right. down. I'll call you in a couple of days. Thank Thanks, you. Tony. Take right. care. Thank you. Uh, he's great. He's great. So but this week. While we were on the podcast he met, he on met, iTunes, the Rook of Rub hit number one. So uh, he met Sinatra. He had dinner with him. He opened for Buddy Agate. I, I, does the list, I mean, does the list get bigger and better? I yeah. mean, I love Gene when he says, you know, okay, uh, yeah, the Tonight Show, uh, Joey Bishop brought me on. Yeah. <laughs> who does Joey, who, you know, who knows Joey Bishop? That's uh, right. Cool. We're Just, a little older. Well, yeah. it, it, it looks like by the comments that we got some great uh, watches tonight, don't we? Yes. Yeah, I was going to pop them up. I didn't want to, you know, that's all right. No, Tony and you, and you are. We got, got it. it. Great but uh, yeah, it was. You know, I, and I I would have went a little longer, but I I want to bring him back uh, for part two. So he's got a couple of other st- stories, but we'll keep that uh, for later on. But, but please go to Tony's website, drop him a note on Facebook or something. Let him know you saw him on our show. <laughs> the guy was hysterical. He was. I, I love it. I love it. Yeah. So uh, next week, Mike. Uh, we got a friend of mine, uh, and when you talk about singers, uh, I mean, really, never mind singers. How about this guy, one of the best writers in the business and one of the best producers? Uh, this guy produced so many albums from the group, the Archies. The great Ron Dante will be with us next week. I am so tickled about, you know, when I was a DJ, Mike, at every uh, V&E's hour, the dessert hour, I would open it up by playing Sugar Sugar. Right, right. So, so I mean, this guy is just, I, I can't wait. I yeah, can't wait. I mean, learn, Gene. Well, a lot of stuff that he did, jingles that are in their heads from years ago. So it's yep. a, a little teaser right there. Yeah, yep. It's just, you know, we have gotten, and, and the list, we got more guests. We're going to put them up on the, the page, reminiscing with Gene DiNapoli on Facebook. Uh, we added two more this week, which I didn't tell you about, but they're going to be in January and February. Uh, we are still looking for sponsors because we like to send our guests a gift. So if, if we're looking for sponsors of a small business, big business, we're being seen all over the United States now. We're being heard on ItalianAmericanRadio.com and YouTube. And soon this will be on Long Island and Bronx Cable. So if you advertise with us, uh, the residual effects We'll keep going and we're not expensive. We just want to be able to publicize the show, maybe get some nice shirts. And we want to send our guests a little gift uh, for doing the show. So we are uh, looking for sponsors. Just send me an inbox message, send Mike a message and we'll get back to you uh, next week. Ron Dante. Let's talk about our sponsors. Once again, Mike. Okay. First off, pure organic dry clean is 3166 East Tremont Avenue in the Bronx. Mention the podcast, pay for three items, get your fourth free. Howard and Karen from Dream Destinations Travel. We got a new logo for them with okay. a website. I'll send it to you. We'll do that next week. Okay. Uh, for honeymoons, please mention our podcast, sweetheel.com for CBD orders. Mention the podcast, get 20% off all your orders. And finally, this week, the creative CPA, Francisco, uh, mention our podcast, get two hours two hours of free consultation wow. so the website yeah we gotta we want people to really get uh the most of their money while they come to our shows yes um, yes and everyone thanks for the comments the guests always go back and they read the comments so absolutely absolutely thank you all uh one girl our friend ellen made a remark that watching our show makes her miss New York since she lives in Florida wow. and she doesn't miss New York often. Uh, thanks to Mike Bello and Jeannie Claire and uh, Bobby A and all the other performers that take time out to watch our show. Uh, Jim Vick Volkner, my friend from Orange County, Tony remembers you. 
Tony remembers you. So uh, next week, Ron Dante, everybody go to Spotify, yeah. YouTube, look up Ron Dante. So you're going to love yes. uh, these guys' songs. Gene, real quick, you just said throughout the whole United States, we had a couple of watchers tonight from Australia, actually, which is... No, we didn't. Yes, we did. It's tomorrow morning there. Wonderful. Right. So yeah. see, when you advertise on the Reminiscing with Gene DiNapoli podcast, it's worldwide. And trust me, yeah. the prices do not go up. No, they don't. <laughs> Mike, did you have fun tonight? I did. I had a, those are great. You know, I was off camera writing, of course, but I, I was laughing. I, a couple of tears came down. It was, it was very, very good stories. A, a very, very entertaining guest. Yeah. Uh, we, yeah. we don't, we hope they continue. Yeah. Uh, uh, everybody's great in their own fields. But tonight you saw uh, for the first time a guy that we consider a triple threat singer, actor, comedian, Tony Darrow. Uh, go on his website, as we said, when you see he's going to be doing a show, you want to go see this guy. Yeah. And I got to tell you, Mike, he doesn't look 82. No way. No way. And and, and Margaret, uh, she, she looks great. His wife is stunning. Yeah. Oh, my God. We have a, a quick picture of her. That's his wife. That's his <laughs> wife. Uh, you're a nut. That's so great. Everybody, thank you. Have a great week. Stay safe. Stay healthy. And yep. um, just send us comments. We'd love to hear your ideas. And uh, God bless you, and God bless America. Good night, Mike. Good night, Gene. One more time. This is Tony Darrow's uh, San Juan right. Dreaming. We're going to take right. it out with that. Let's Good night, go Gene. Good night, everybody. Every morning when the sun comes up, I get up and I go downtown. The work is hard and the days are long And darling, the nights are even longer But each time I weaken just the thought of you makes me stronger Darling, I'm saying one dreaming Oh, I'm pushing the card with a song in my heart Though I'm not really here Oh, I'm saying, I'm dreaming. Oh, I'm dreaming.